My friends, coming up will be JBS's telecast of a World Zionist Congress election forum with representatives of slates, what we normally refer to as political parties, all of whom are hoping you will cast your online vote for them to become delegates to this year's World Zionist Congress, which will convene in October in Jerusalem. Now, most American Jews know little or nothing about how the World Zionist Congress works or what it does. And most American Jews don't even know that an election is taking place right now. So as we prepare to bring you the upcoming World Zionist Congress Election Forum, I'd like to take a moment to help give you a better understanding of what these elections are all about and why they are, in fact, very important to any Jew who cares about the future of the Jewish state. This year's elections, which begin on January 21st and will extend through March 11th, will elect delegates to the 38th World Zionist Congress. The first World Zionist Congress met in August of 1897 in Basel, Switzerland, and was chaired by the formal founder of the Zionist movement, Theodor Herzl. At that first Congress, 208 delegates from 17 different countries gathered in a quixotic attempt to create a Jewish homeland in a world where the Jew had no home anywhere. In Basel, the delegates crafted a Zionist platform, which became known as the Basel Program, and they founded what is now called the World Zionist Organization, the WZO. That first World Jewish Congress also made Hatikva its national anthem, which of course has become the national anthem of the State of Israel and of the Jewish people. Now, after 1897, a World Zionist Congress was held every year for the next four years. And the fifth World Zionist Congress in 1901 established Karen Kayemet, known in America as the Jewish National Fund, with the express purpose of purchasing land in Eretz Yisrael for the Jewish people and their new homeland. After 1901, the World Zionist Congress convened every two years, except for a hiatus during World War I. At the 16th Congress in 1929, the Jewish Agency for Israel was formally created to foster Aliyah, and to help absorb the millions of Jewish families who would immigrate to Israel from the diaspora. The Jewish Agency also served as the coordinating body of the Jews of Palestine, under the leadership of David Ben-Gurion, who was elected chairman in 1935. Since the end of World War II, the World Zionist Congress has met every four years, and has decided policy on a broad range of social, economic, educational issues, including how Jews will return to Eretz Israel and how they will settle the land, which of course remains one of the most contentious issues inside the Jewish community since it now involves the West Bank. Now again, this year, Elections are taking place throughout the Jewish world for the 38th World Zionist Congress. 500 delegates from throughout the Jewish world will be elected this year to the World Zionist Congress. American Jewry will elect 153 of those 500 delegates, which means that American Jewry represents roughly 30% of the Congress. And what exactly will these 500 elected delegates do? Why should any American Jew care who's elected as one of America's 153 Jewish delegates? Well, these delegates will decide for the Jewish world how to allocate, how to spend $1 billion on various projects and programs in the state of Israel. That's $1 billion. 
And some reports figure that it could be as large as up to $5 billion. And with the power of the purse comes political power and influence. For example, on the issue of Jewish pluralism in the state of Israel, controlled today by the official Orthodox rabbinate, the delegates will decide if both Orthodox and non-Orthodox institutions will be funded by the World Zionist Organization, or which schools will receive how much funding, which social programs will be funded, and where and issues relating to Jewish communities on the West Bank will also be dealt with by the World Zionist Congress. Will West Bank communities be funded? Should funds be used to expand Jewish settlement on the West Bank or not? So what we all have to understand and appreciate is that the philosophy of the various slates, all hoping to win as many delegates as possible, is very important to anyone who has strong feelings, one way or the other, about policies relating to Israel and how much money will go to support and expand various Jewish institutions in Israel. The delegate composition of the World Zionist Congress, the ideology of the various members elected during the seven-week period which ends March 11th, will directly affect how money is allocated and therefore how policy is shaped in Israel. And these policies will affect individual Jews and non-Jews living in the state of Israel. You have an opportunity to help shape the 38th World Zionist Congress to best reflect your perspective on all the issues we Jews must deal with every day. Now, who are the American Jews hoping to become delegates to the 38th World Zionist Congress? Who are they? Do you know any of them? This year, there are 15 slates running in our American elections, representing the entire gamut of opinion in the American Jewish community, from progressive to conservative, from orthodox to reform, a variety of Zionist philosophies. In the last World Zionist Congress in 2015, some 57,000 American Jews voted. Since the largest number of affiliated American Jews are members of Reform synagogues, it's not surprising that Artsa, the Zionist arm of Reform Jewry, won the most votes, over 21,000. This gave Artsa Slate 56 seats in the 37th World Zionist Congress, just under 40% of American Jewry's total delegates. Merkaz, the Zionist arm of the conservative movement and the second largest Jewish affiliated constituency, had just shy of 10,000 votes and won 25 seats in the World Zionist Congress, less than half as many as the reform movement's Artsa. And in the Orthodox community, the vote Torah slate, self-described as religious Zionists, also were shy of 10,000 votes and wound up with 24 seats. And those three slates, Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox Religious Zionists, made up 105 of the 145 American seats in the 37th World Zionist Congress, accounting for 72% of all American delegates. American Forum for Israel won 10 seats. The progressive coalition known as Hatikva won 8 seats. The right-leaning ZOA, Zionist Organization of America, and the Zionist Spring Slate each won 7 seats. O of A Tziona, Sephardic Slate, won four seats, and three slates, New Zionist Vision, Green Israel, and Cherut, representing the philosophy of Vladimir Jabotinsky, won a total of four seats among them. And that's how the last American World Zionist Congress elections wound up 
in 2015. This year, most of these slates are once again competing with one another for as many of your votes as possible. And how are these organizational slates hoping to win more and more of your votes? Well, for the most part, these slates do not try to win votes the way political parties do in American elections. In American elections, Democrats and Republicans are each going after every American vote, including voters of the opposing party, and especially independent, undecided voters. The entire voting population is being appealed to in American elections. Not so in World Zionist Congress elections. In World Zionist Congress elections, organizations do not spend a lot of energy reaching out to the general American Jewish public. Rather, each organization or coalition of organizations, which many slates are, focus their efforts primarily on galvanizing their own membership to vote for them. So Artsa, for example, of the Reform Movement, is doing everything it can to encourage members of Reform congregations to cast votes for Artsa. Hatikva, a coalition of progressive organizations, including J Street and Amenu and Americans for Peace Now, the New Israel Fund, the National Council of Jewish Women, and a number of other progressive Zionist organizations, is hoping that each individual organization in their coalition will get out the vote of its membership for the Hatikva slate. Which is why, by and large, the World Zionist Congress elections are not directed to you, Jews in the overall American Jewish community, but are directed to the memberships of the participating slates. And that explains why so many of you may not have been solicited for your vote and why you may not even have known this election was taking place or why you should care about voting at all in this election. Well, we think you should know what the World Zionist Congress is. It didn't dissolve over the years. It's still a very active and important part of Jewish life. It determines where Jewish money goes, and that's everything. And you should also have a real understanding of what this election is and have a good idea of what the various slates each stand for, what their platform, what their message is, and what their perspective is on issues that will determine how $1 billion of Jewish money is allocated and spent. Which brings us to another oddity of these elections in America. Even in most parliamentary elections in countries like Israel or Great Britain, individuals, specific personalities, candidates, become the face of the party. In American presidential elections, most of us vote for a presidential candidate, and the party is secondary. In Israel, each party is led by a high-profile candidate. But in the World Zionist Congress elections, because each organization is really appealing to its own membership, the people, the faces leading each state, are not front and center before the general Jewish community. So if you ask people who know about these elections, who've even voted in this election already, whom they voted for, most voters have no idea. Not all. There are many Jews who make sure they learn who's heading the slate they're voting for. But most of the time, Jews vote for their organization, not for the individual members on their slate. Now, does it matter if voters know who's on a given slate? In one sense, maybe not. You're voting for an organization with a specific ideology. If you support that ideology, be it religious or secular, progressive or conservative, it may not be important whom you'll be sending 
to the 38th World Zionist Congress. But it's interesting, isn't it, to see names you might recognize on various slates, to be able to imagine that's the person you're sending to represent your philosophy in the world governing body of the Jewish people. And to be sure, when you look at the list of candidates of each slate, the overwhelming number of names are ones the general Jewish public does not know at all. Most of them are members of the slates that are part of specific organizations. Their leadership, their leaders in the organizations. But for those of you who watch JBS, for example, there are names you might know. So, for example, Artsa the Zionist arm of the reform movement, which has more than 100 candidates on their list, is led by URJ President Rabbi Rick Jacobs and includes Rabbi Angela Buchdahl, who conducts Shabbat services from Central Synagogue every week here on JBS. Mayor Kaz, the party of the conservative movement, which is led by Rabbi Deborah Newman Kamen, includes Dr. Arnie Eisen, and Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove. The Mizrahi Slate, a mainstream Orthodox coalition, is led by Rabbi Herschel Schachter and includes Rabbi Marvin Heyer of the Simon Wiesendahl Center and Rabbi Haskell Lukstein and Alan Fagan of the OU, the Orthodox Union. Hatikva, again a coalition of progressive Jewish organizations, is led by Kenneth Bob of Amenu and includes such high-profile figures as Jeremy ben Peter Beinart, Ruth Messenger, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, and Sam Norwich. ZOA, the American Zionist Party most associated with the right, is led by ZOA President Morton Klein and includes Brooke Goldstein. Dorche Toravitzion, a modern Orthodox party, is led by Rabbi Avi Weiss and includes Rabbi Mark Angel, a leading Sephardic rabbi on the American Jewish scene. Ohave Tzion, the party of the American Sephardic community, is led by Rabbi Eli Abadi. Kol Yisrael, again a coalition of Stand With Us and the Israeli American Council, is led by Esther Renzer and includes Roz Rothstein. Cheirut, which embodies the philosophy of the great revisionist of modern Zionism, Vladimir Jabotinsky, is led by Joshua Goldstein and includes Susie Rosenbluth. Vision, a slate of younger Jewish Zionists, has a photo on its website that includes Rudy Rachman, founder of SSI Students Supporting Israel at Columbia. Americans for Israel an independent Zionist organization is led by James Schiller with Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt and Mitchell Bard. Yisrael Sholanu, a slate formed by a group of Israeli American Jews, is led by Shani Korabelnik, Shas Olami, an Orthodox party supporting the Sephardic rabbinate of Israel, is led by Rabbi Sasson Natan. American Forum for Israel, which represents Jews from the former Soviet Union, is led by Dmitry Shiglik and includes Gregory Davidson, who now runs RTM, the Russian Television Network of America. And Eretz HaKodesh, representing the Orthodox Yeshiva community, is led by Rabbi Pesach Lerner. And Eretz HaKodesh is the only slate which has decided not to participate in our election forums since most of their members do not watch television. And for those of you who have not yet voted online, we hope that the next three nights, when you'll be able to really get to know 14 of the 15 slates running in this year's World Zionist Congress elections, will both move you to make the effort to vote and will give you some substance some understanding of each slate so that you can make a most intelligent and meaningful choice. So let's assume many of you do decide to vote after watching these election forums on JBS. How does the election work? 
what determines how many delegates from each slate will actually go to Israel? Well, as in any parliamentary election with many parties, it's all about proportional voting, just as it is in Israel. If a slate wins 40% of the vote, the top 40% of those on the list will become delegates to the 38th World Zionist Congress. It's that simple. By the way, each elected delegate is permitted to bring two alternates with them. These alternates do not vote unless something happens to the elected delegate. And the idea here is to expand the number of Jews worldwide who participate in the World Zionist Congress and become enthused about the work it does, even if they don't vote. So the last remaining question is, who may vote for an American slate in a World Zionist Congress election? There are five qualifications that make a person eligible to vote. First, you must be Jewish. And who determines if you're Jewish? You do. Anyone who self-identifies as a Jew is accepted as a Jew for purposes of voting in the World Zionist Congress elections. And while the question who is a Jew may be an issue for the State of Israel, it is not an issue for the World Zionist Congress. Very interesting. Issues of patrilineal descent, or which rabbi oversees a conversion, or a valid get, a Jewish divorce document, or degrees of Jewish observance. None of these issues play any role at all in determining a Jew's eligibility to vote in this election. You consider yourself a Jew, you call yourself a Jew, you're a Jew, and you're qualified to vote. Second, you must be a permanent American resident who will not be voting in Israeli elections. Third, you must be at least 18 years old. Fourth, you need to register. Very easy, online at ZionistElection.org. If you're over 25 years of age, it costs you $7.50 to register. If you're between the ages of 18 and 25, it only costs you $5 to register. And by registering, a computerized system permits you to cast only one vote. And then there's one more piece to the process, and this is somewhat controversial. You must also accept the Jerusalem program. What is the Jerusalem program? Well, it's the platform of the World Zionist Organization, which was formally adopted in 2004, replacing the Basel program created by the first Zionist Congress in 1897. The Jerusalem program has basically six planks, which a person is asked to commit to if he or she wants to vote in the World Zionist Congress election. They include such things as recognizing the historic Jewish tie to the land of Israel, Eretz Yisrael, and to Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, a commitment to Aliyah for Jews throughout the world, doing everything possible to build an Israel that is both Jewish and democratic, representing the diversity of the Jewish people and striving for peace and improving the world, a commitment to all forms of Jewish learning and to Hebrew as Israel's national language, and to defending Jews from all forms of anti-Semitism. Now, for most American Jews, American Zionists, across the social and political spectrum, there's little that's controversial in these first five planks. They're all sort of obvious if you believe in developing a thriving Jewish state. But then we come to the sixth and last plank, which some American Jews find very controversial, while others also see it as obvious as the first five. 
The sixth plank asks a commitment to settling the country as an expression of practical Zionism. What does this plank mean? Zionists differ over what settling the country means, or more specifically, what the country means. Does the country refer to the state of Israel as defined by the ceasefire lines of 1949, which created the boundaries that existed till the Six-Day War of 1967, an accidental border which became known as the Green Line? Or is the Jerusalem program defining the country as all of Eretz Israel, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, including the West Bank, which came into Israeli control during its defensive war of 1967. If the Jerusalem program defines the country as only the land inside the Green Line, settling the country has one meaning. But if the Jerusalem program defines the country to also include the West Bank, what is Jewishly called Judea and Samaria, then the phrase settling the country has quite a different meaning. And one of the most serious divisions between the progressive wing of the Zionist movement and the more traditionally observant wing of the Zionist movement centers around the two possible interpretations of what settling the country means. And that's a question you have to answer for yourself. And you may find it most interesting to hear how the various slates will interpret this plank. But the relevance of the meaning of this sixth plank is that to be eligible to vote in World Zionist Congress elections, one is honor bound to commit to all of the planks of the Jerusalem program. So if you haven't voted yet in the 2020 World Zionist elections, and you want to, and you're a self-identified Jew, and you're a permanent American resident who will not be voting in Israeli elections, and you're 18 years of age or older, and you've registered online to vote, and you accept the entire Jerusalem platform, then I hope as you watch JBS's World Zionist Congress election forum, that you'll listen to what the various slates espouse regarding their respective philosophies of Zionism and make as informed a choice as possible of which slate to vote for, and then vote. Your vote can make a big difference in how one billion dollars will be allocated by the next World Zionist Congress. I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. And Am Yisrael Chai. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.